The only difference is between a guy that works for a hedge fund and manages a billion dollars and you or some retail trader, the only difference is the business card. You can beat these people. Just understand it, it, it's a very small amount of people that are going to do that. And so therefore, if you want to be part of a very small amount of people, then you have to think differently than the large amount of people. I think the main takeaway from me, from a market thing, is that... All right, folks, here we are in trading up. We've got Jason Shapiro in the house. Uh, you may know him from the book, Unknown Market Wizards. Uh, we've got him on the show here. He's a contrarian trader slash investor, and uh, we're going to find out his story, uh, how he got into trading, and what he does uh, in the markets these days. So, Jason, welcome to the show. All right, thanks for having me. Now, start off with, to, just to give the guys who don't know you uh, a bit of a background, I mean, how did you get started in trading? Where did all your journey begin and and let's take it all the way through to where you are now. Yeah, I think I got started probably in a similar way that most people get started. I was a kid and uh, I had my first job. I was working for a bank and I was pretty bored and uh, I was in Hong Kong at the time. And uh, there was like this bull market going on around me and uh, it sounded exciting. And uh, and I got involved and just started, you know, trading it. And, you know, like I say, I went through what most people go through, you know, uh, was young enough and dumb enough to over leverage and all that and so i made a whole bunch of money that i shouldn't have made to begin with and gave it all back because i didn't know what i was doing and uh up and down like that that was kind of how it started and so how did things how did you turn things around i mean did you just carry on from there or did you take a break at all no i carried on from there and i i, I was about uh you know i had actually read the first market wizards book yeah uh, and it really had an impression on me in terms of a trading and but be where i thought i'd like my life to go um being young and ignorant at the time um it just sounded like something i wanted to do so i, I stuck with this and it took me about 10 years um of up and down yo-yo as they say you know making and losing and making and losing before i really made a decision that uh i just wasted 10 years of my life and if i really want to do this then I really have to figure out uh, how I'm going to do this successfully. So I went back and really got into how to make my trading disciplined and, and, and how to focus on the things that really work over time and how to get out of trading for excitement and focus on trading to make money, you know, um, and treat it like a business and, and all that type of stuff. So I went through a long period of that, put something together and then started trading that and, and have essentially been trading the process that I trade now since then. So and, and about during 25. that up 25 years well wow. folks if you're looking for a prop firm at the moment and you want someone who's been around for ages flexible reliable and has low profit targets then check out my sponsors blue guardian so these guys i've been trading with them for the last eight months they've been sponsoring the show for about that amount of time and they even have guys on my live stream trading them as well so what i found is their commission seems to be lower than some of the competitors out there so really great trading environment and they offer now c trader and some other fantastic trading platforms as well if you want to check them out there's a coupon code in the description or just use it trading that all one word and get 10 cent off at checkout there's a qr code you can grab here as well all right folks let's get on with the show i mean uh, and during the up and down process i mean were you sort of like we did you consider yourself a full-time trader at that point or were you like i'm working a job and i'm doing a bit of trading on the side and you know it, it was it was more of i was a working uh, a job in the markets um trading um uh and then left and uh for a couple of years, just traded for myself, um, full time. And then, um, yeah. And then had what I would consider my third, uh, blow up. And oh, after my. that one, I was like, okay, I really need to figure out what, what I want to do from here. So you must've been making some money, you know, some money doing what you were doing then, like you know, a couple of years, unless you were just about surviving off, you know, savings that you'd made whilst you were working. Uh, I mean, how did that sort of journey go from like a, I suppose, you know, leaving your full-time employment to your first attempt at being a full-time trader? So I left working and I went to business school for a year um, and I traded while I was in business school. Right. And I, and I had a real good year trading that year. So I didn't take a job um, and I went off and I actually moved to Phuket and got a place on the beach and brought a satellite dish in and, and was going to live, uh, you know, the greatest life in the world on the beach trading and all that. Yeah. And it took me about a year to blow out. And then I had to go and figure out what I was going to do. 
So, okay, right. You obviously reconstructed things. It's almost like, you know, a, a sports person getting an injury um, and coming back, re, re, regrouping, coming back. I mean, how on earth do you come back from, you know, going through through a roller coaster and to a point where you got, I'm, I'm going to fix all of, the, all of the things that are going wrong. I mean, how do you do that? I mean, where do you even start? So an important thing that I did along the way at some point, you know, like many people, I read a lot of trading books, be it fundamental analysis, technical analysis, trading psychology, how to trade for a living, all these type of books. And I was pretty diligent in keeping a uh, good trading record um, uh, and, and good notes on my trading, um, a diary, so to speak. Yeah. And so I was able to go back through that diary and really try to figure out um, what has really worked for me over time. Not one trade that I might remember, right? But what type of trades actually worked over time and what type of trades may have worked once but didn't work over time. And I sort of eliminated those, obviously, and tried to focus on the ones that had worked over time and tried to find the process within that idea. Um, and then <clears throat> focused on that, have been focusing on that ever since. And, and if somebody was to like take one of those pages from your diary, I mean, what kind of stuff would be in that page? So I used to put it like, here's the type of trade I'm doing. So this is a, a breakout trade, okay? And here's the chart, and here's the reasons. Here's the breakout. Here's where I'm supposed to exit. Here's where I'm supposed to, you know, take profit. Here's where I'm supposed to take loss, you know, um, that type of thing. So it was a, a test of my discipline to that trade, which I didn't always adhere to. Um, and also whether these trades actually work. Do breakout trades actually work for me or you know, is this does whatever kind of trade actually work yeah. for me? Uh, that's really what it looked like. Okay. So it wasn't sort of like in depth, you know, mindset stuff like I'm feeling like crappy today or, you know, I feel like top of the world and then the trade was a win. It was more just like these are the trades. Do they work or not? Um, right. And so what kind of trades from that did you establish were the ones that were, you know, more, more profitable than the others? So what I found, um, and from what I do now, and again, it has to fit sort of, I found your personality in a way, you know, like I can show you how I trade. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be successful trading the way that I trade, just like you could show me how you trade. And it doesn't mean I'm going to be successful trading the way you trade. Right. Yeah. I think that's an important aspect to it. It has to fit what you do, what you believe and all that. So me being sort of a very contrarian person, I had to uh, stick with contrarian type of stuff, um, but I had to learn the lesson that being contrarian can get you very run over um, if you're doing it in a in a weird in a stubborn kind of way, right? And what I found was being contrarian price is a huge mistake, right? Um, I'm not if you keep shorting something just because it's going up, you, 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 there's a good chance you're going to get run over over time. And if you're going to keep buying something just because it's going down, there's a good chance you're going to get run over over time. So I had to transfer from being contrarian price um, to a couple things. One, I am contrarian what I could consider positioning. So I'm not buying something because it's gone down a lot. I'm buying something because I find that there's a huge amount of short interest out there. Right. That's one. So I'm being contrarian positioning rather than price. Mm. And two, no matter what you do, no matter what kind of trading you do, um, you have to let the market confirm what you want to do first, right? You're not going to tell the market what to do. You know, you have to let yeah. the market tell you what to do, right? So here it is. I want to buy this thing because I think everybody's short, but I'm not going to do it until the market gives me some kind of confirmation first. And confirmation it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But at the very least, let's say I want to buy this thing. It keeps going down. It's keep going down. I'm not going to keep buying it. I'm going to wait until it does something like, let's say, crosses the 20 day moving average the other way. OK, then maybe that's confirmation or however you want to do confirmation. Um, but you need some kind of market confirmation. Yeah. So so would you say like there's there's any like fundamental aspect of, to the criteria and stuff that you do? Mm, for me, when I talk about like I need a market confirmation, for example, I can give you a perfect example. Right now, I'm looking to buy the soybean complex. Okay, soy meal, right, is a trade that I'm looking to make here. Mm. Um, it's been going down. People are now mega short. I want to get long, but 
but I need a market confirmation. So for me, what market confirmation means is when the market can shake off what the fundamental news is. So let's say soybeans have been going down because the supply numbers have been coming out way above expectations, okay? So on Friday, we have new supply numbers coming out. So what I'm looking for is those supply numbers. This is fundamental, right? Those supply numbers to come out way above expectations and let mm. the number be bearish and then have the market not go down on that. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. That's my market confirmation. That's somewhat based on, it's not based on fundamentals of predicting future supply and demand. It's based on fundamentals of this is what the market is looking at as the fundamentals. This is what the market sees as hugely negative fundamentals. And now the market can't go down yeah. on that. Um, so therefore, it's starting to confirm that I should go the other way. So so when you say you're seeing a trending market and everyone's like, oh, I'm going to get in this trend. It's awesome. You know, you're like, I can't wait till this damn thing ends. And I'm, I'm in there on the other side of this trend. So you're kind of picking the reversals, tops and bottoms. Would you would you say that? But without strictly blindly picking okay i think this is the top's going to be here. most of my trades end up being yes turn picking type of things yeah um yeah that's what most of my not all but most of my trades tend to be that and so how do you sort of establish a a, a solid place to put a stop loss and um determine so where to get out i i think that's really at the end of the day probably uh why my stuff has worked over time it's it's more about that than anything else right mm. it's good because like let's say Again, let's say soy meal on Friday. They have this huge negative news, right? And soy meal is pretty close to new lows here, right? So it probably makes a new low on that news mm. during the day if that comes out hugely negative. And then it reverses and closes up, okay? I will buy that close. So I'm picking the turn. So if it were to make a new low two days later, a week later, whatever, then clearly I didn't pick the turn, you know? Yeah. yeah. So therefore I stop out. So I know where I get in. I know what my stop is. I know what I am prepared to lose per trade. So I size it to that, the difference between my entry and my stop. And I get out on something that, this is also a very important concept, I think, when you're trading. I'm getting in because I think I picked the turn. So if it makes a new low, then by definition, I didn't pick the turn. So I'm yeah. out. Yep. It, it, didn't, it didn't hold to my theory. So my theory is wrong. I'm out. Okay, next trade, you know? And it's the same thing on my way out. Well, how do you get out? Well, I'm getting in because I see everybody as mega short, okay? Well, if the trade ends up working and starts going my way, where am I going to get out? Oh, do I trail the stop? Do I pick a spot? Do I take half off here? Do I take it? Blah, 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 blah. The theory is that everybody's short. Therefore, the market's going to squeeze higher. The market squeezes higher. And now I look at the positioning data and now everybody's not short anymore. Well, then my edge is gone, so I take my profit. I mean, it just, it all has to kind of match what you're doing, what it is you're trying to accomplish, you know? Okay. So, so it's almost like the, the, the exit of the, you know, profitable trade is the reverse situation of the entry for you. Which That's what the you, edge, the edge is supposed yeah. to be. Everybody's short, therefore, there's a chance this thing could squeeze a lot higher. Yeah. Well, now no, everybody's not short anymore. Okay. Well, then what am I doing? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm out. Doesn't mean the market can't keep going higher. It can. Market can do anything, right? Yeah. Like, that's not my problem. You know what I mean? That, that's not my issue. My issue is they're super short. Now they're no longer super short, so I'm out. Yeah. And so, I mean, like with that, you know, without knowing exactly what trades you were taking, but I mean, like it sounds like you, you you're in the in the position of being able to get some kind of really big wins based on a risk to reward. Point I mean, that's of view. Is, that, that's is that... the whole thing. You know, what I mean, less than half my trades make money. But my wins tend to be four and a half, five times what I lose. So right. that's really what you want to do. Lose a dollar, lose a dollar, make four. Lose a dollar, lose a dollar, make four. Yeah. Forever, you know? And so, so I mean, like, to, to the point where, like, I suppose you obviously got enough attention to to be, you know, considered for this book, Unknown Market Wizards. I mean, how did that all come about? I mean, what were you doing at the time to to get, get in front of... Um, Jack Schwager, is it that that writes? The yeah, I, you know that was just uh, from what I understand. He 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 put a thing out somewhere asking people if they knew anybody that would be a good candidate for the book, and a guy I know sent to him. You should talk to Jason Shapiro. Um, and 
he did. He called me up and we talked for a while and I met him and he's like, I'd like you to be in the book. And uh, I was a little bit hesitant. Um, but in the end, I, I agreed to do it, mostly uh, at the chiding of my friends. Um, Market Wizard, the first Market Wizards book was like our Bible back in the day, you know? Yeah. We used to quote it like on a daily basis. You know what I mean? Um, so my friends were like, dude, you got to be in it. So it's funny yeah. because back then when I was 23 years old, my dream would have been to be in Market Wizards and just funny how life works. And then the chance comes up and I'm like, you know what? I, at this point in my life, I really don't yeah. care. To be, I'm not looking for publicity or anything. You know what I mean? So like, I don't really need it, but, um, but I did it and I'm glad I did. Jack's a great guy. And, uh, because of it, I, I I've actually met some, some really cool people. So awesome. Hey folks, what a view behind me. I'm at Black Bull Markets headquarters here in Auckland, New Zealand. Speaking of views, you can get TradingView paid plans for free at Black Bull Markets, saving you up to $600 a year. That's right, get either the Essential Plus or Premium plans absolutely free, and all you need to do is trade from one lot a month at Black Bull Markets. And you can also get a 100% deposit bonus for your first deposit up to $1,000. All you need to do is click the Trading Nut link in the description below. Now, now, what if, like, if somebody hasn't read the book, um, and I, I've definitely read the first one, I don't think I've read the second one. Uh, what would be the main takeaway from uh, what you've shared in the book? I mean, what did you want the main takeaway to be about you know your journey, your experience here? I think the main takeaway for me from a market thing is that the market's a discounting mechanism, right? So if you're going to beat the market, you have to beat the discounting mechanism, right? All known information is in the market. So what do you know that the market doesn't know, right? And the answer to me is, again, positioning it, it is the discounting mechanism to me. Everybody looks at the discounting mechanism as price, right? Price has gone up and it's discounting in this good news. Whereas I see it as positioning. Everybody is long this thing, therefore it's discounted in the good news. I think that that, I believe very strongly, that is the driver of markets, right? Mm. That is the driver of the discounting mechanism, is the, is, is the participation not price. Now, clearly a lot of times price and participation are correlated. Nothing like a market going straight up to get people long, you know? Um, but you have to wait. If you're looking to pick a turn, you have to wait for mass participation. Um, so that's the main market thing that I tried to get through in that book is participation and not price is the discounting mechanism. I think some of the other things, um, now that time has gone on and I've gotten a lot of feedback from people and comments from people and um is is the message that you know here i am i'm in this market wizards book okay i'm supposed to be like some market wizard right and the truth is i have no ability to predict the future any better than anybody else on the planet you know if i'm called a market wizard um it has everything to do with the fact that i take losses better than most people that's about mm -hmm. it yeah, you know, it's about risk management. You know, I handle my my risk management better than everybody else. Market's going to go up, market's going to down. I'm going to have my opinions, not my. You know, I don't predict. No, nobody can predict the future. Okay, you're certainly not going to predict the future better than the market because the market is everyone in the world predicting the future at the same time, right? So if you're going to out try to think you're going to outthink the market, you're going to lose over time. Mm. Um, so it, it's really about risk reward, getting yourself into risk reward positions. And being very disciplined about how you take losses and 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 let profits run, you know. And and so like I mean that's you know I've I've had a couple of other traders on in the past where and it sounds like you may fall into the same bucket around, um, you know some some guys who are heavily technical will just go back and back test you know a thousand trades and and get their edge off that. It doesn't sound like you're one of them. Uh, I mean, it sounds like you're like I've got a theory. And that theory in, sh in turn should work more often than not. I mean, how did you get confidence that this was going to be, you know, the way to go forward for you? What was the thing that gave you the most confidence? Just, you know, time. And like I said, I went through all my old trades. Those were, were the ones that were giving me the best risk reward trades. So I had that. And then I just started doing it. And, and it's hard because you have to, if you really want to judge what you're doing is right or wrong, then you have to be disciplined enough to only do what you're doing and not do other trades, right? Mm. It's a hard part. This is all part of discipline, right? Discipline is very, very hard. As we know, the markets are open all day. I say, look, I trade 37 markets, right? If I have no trades on today, well, there's 37 trades that I just missed in theory, right? Because each one of those markets is either up or down today. And each one of them, I could have either been long or short, right? 
but that's not what I'm doing. I'm waiting for my specific setup. I'm waiting for my specific, you know, slow pitch, so to call, so to speak, right? Fat pitch, as they call it. Yeah. And I'm putting that on. And, and in time, you know, um, as time went on and then the thing worked, then clearly, you know, you become confident, right? I'm, I'm never totally confident. I'm always looking for that time where I'm monitoring my returns all the time to see when they fall outside of expectations. Cause if they do, then I have to be like, what the hell is going on? Right. In particular on the downside, when they fall outside of expectation on the upside, you're not going to hear me bitch too much, but when they fall outside of expectations on the downside, yeah. then I have to start digging into what's going on, what's going wrong, what's happening. Is this thing no longer work, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But knock wood to this point, I haven't, I haven't had that problem. So, and that helps with the discipline too, because everybody, no matter how good you are, has drawdowns, right? And every time you're having drawdowns, you, you feel like you're never going to have a winning trade again, right? But as long as it's falling inside of my return stream expectations, then I feel like this is just a part of it. You know, I say this, it's harder as it's going on. Every time I lose money, I, I'm pissed off. But, yeah. you know, the truth is I feel like, look, this is part of it. I look at my return history and I say my return history is exactly what I want it to be. And within that history, I've had these drawdowns of more than what I'm going through now. So, you know, you just have to keep, sticking to the process and, and and let it work for you over time yeah yeah and i suppose with with the bigger reward trades it it can quickly come back and you know make itself a positive outcome as opposed to you know just losing consistently and and, and never getting back there or taking forever to get back now are there, are there any markets you don't try i mean it sounds like 37 is quite a lot big basket i mean what markets would you do you not trade or you you stay away from and, and what are the reasons for that so i'm a futures trader i trade all the U.S. futures markets that have liquidity. You know, I trade quite a bit of money, so I need liquidity. Um, and I only trade the U.S. futures markets because those are the ones that have the data that I like to use. Mm. So that's really what I'm limited to, U.S. futures markets that have enough liquidity for me. So that's about 37 markets. So so you would you trade like crypto, for example, within the futures market? So I do not trade crypto, but I, I could, I think I could now. Um, I do pay a lot of attention to crypto and I have been like in my um, newsletter and stuff, which my newsletter is originally was notes to myself. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, so in, and I still kind of treat it as that. So I have been doing crypto trades in that using the data because crypto is a relatively newer futures market. I, I, I don't have enough history of the data to be able to use it, you know, and believe in it. Mm. We're starting to build that as time goes on. So I am tracking crypto trades based on that data um, that I that I use. And, and out of all the markets you trade, have you got any that have kind of like outliers in terms of your favorites that tend to give you more trades or give you uh, trades that work better? So the, the markets that I think that have been the best over time for me have been the stock indices and um, and the currencies. I don't know why that is. I feel like with stock indices, it's probably the case because if I'm sitting here trying to read psychology and I'm sitting here trying to read what our people do think is moving this market and I'm looking to fade that, you know what I mean? I can get a great read on that because everybody talks about stocks all the time. So yeah. I, I know what people are thinking. You know, it's hard like, oh, I want to get short lean hogs because everybody's long. Well, what's driving the lean hog market? You know, some kind of supply and demand thing. But they don't come out with very much data points, and I can't really get a, a, a great read on the underlying psychology because no one's talking about lean hogs, you know. Um, but with stocks, certainly I can get that. Currencies have worked very well for me, but mostly be, not because I've had a bigger hit ratio, but because some of the winners have been massive. Right. Um, I've caught um, just about every currency intervention I, I've caught on the good side of. Right. Um, which is not a coincidence because I'm looking at positioning, right? And I know for a fact that central banks, before they intervene, will also look at positioning. They're not just yeah. going to start intervening and buying some currency if everybody's not short because they're just throwing good money after bad. If everybody's short and they start buying it, they know those shorts are going to have to run for cover and it's going to help their cause, right? Mm. So I've caught some very big moves in the currency markets because of that. And so those very big moves have helped to make money, good money in those over time, as opposed to, you know, getting it right a large percentage of the time. Did, were you on the right side of the, uh, the Swissy, the peg being pulled on the Swissy? Right. So that was one of the ones where, okay, I thought It was so. probably the biggest trade I ever had. Right. Wow. That's crazy. And, and, and it's a humongous argument, by the way, uh, for me, at least I'm biased clearly, but 
when you want to argue whether markets are about fundamentals or positioning, right? So I caught that trade. Um, I don't know. And people are like, well, you couldn't have known the Swiss bank was going to come in and intervene. And I'm like, you're right. I couldn't have, right? What I knew was people were mega short. It stopped going down on bad news. And I got long, just like I always do. And then they came out over the weekend. They intervened. And there were so many people caught short that the thing rallied, you know, some ridiculous amount, right? But if you look, within three months, the positioning obviously in two days got out because everybody got mm -hmm. squeezed out, right? Mm -hmm. And within three months, the Swissy came right back to where it started. So where was the fundamental change? It went right back to where it started. Once the positioning <laughs> was done, the thing just went right back. Yeah. So you want to argue with me that that was about fundamentals? Go right ahead. But what I'm telling you is it doesn't look that way to me. Yeah. So so if somebody was to like, you know, go, okay, well, I'm going to look at the, the price chart and go, how do I see, a, you know, positioning happening? What am I looking for? there i mean is there any are there any specifics or like can you give us an example of maybe one so thing the, that the thing that at? i like to use the most is the commitments of traders data which which is released by the u.s yeah. futures exchanges um and we have developed our own charts for that that are real interactive and all that stuff but that's what i look at the most for positioning okay so so you you see that and like so it's actually not the charts it's it's more the other information that comes comes with that you know, well, we chart it, but it's, you know, yeah. you're just looking at it and saying, okay, yeah. these guys are, so you can look at the chart, this is the shortest they've been in four years or whatever, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and then I index it, you know what I mean? So the index is saying whatever, the index is at zero, mm -hmm. indicating their maximum short, or the index is at 100, indicating their maximum long, and that's when I then start looking for the market confirmation to get a trade. Right. And so, like, you, you know, 37 markets, you've said that you might be sitting on the sidelines at points. I mean, how often are you going to be in a trade and, you know, placing a you know, trade it, in the course of a week it, it, it's no nah, i mean i usually throughout history put on maybe like four to five trades a month typically um and that's mostly because i'll have like maybe two markets set up and i'll buy one and it'll get stopped and two weeks later i'll get a new failure and i'll buy it again you know so it ends up being maybe four bunch of, but i was looking over 24 years i've been totally out of the market for a total of about two months and this year I've been out of the market for three straight months. I've been in the market all year. Oh, um, right. Which, what, what, yeah, which has just never happened to me, right? I'm talking about a total of two months, a total of two months in 24 years that I was totally out of the market. And now I'm out of, totally out of the market, three months straight. But, you know, it, it speaks to, again, I'm biased, but it speaks to something else that I talk about with the commitments of traders stuff. Is a, a lot of, I don't think that the positioning necessarily gives an edge in predicting the future but it gives a great edge in risk reward, right? Yeah. Um, doesn't mean just because people are crowded that the market's going to turn, but what it means is if it turns, it could turn huge, right? And what it's done for me, what these last three months have done is think like, so I'll be very negatively correlated by definition to things like trend following, right? Mm. Um, so I'm picking turns, right? So the last three months have been massive for trend following and I'm flat. So if I can make money when trend following is losing money and I can be flat when trend following is crushing it, then that's a home run. And rather than just fading these trends, which I would have done in my old days, right, and losing money during it, the commitments of traders has not shown me that anything is crowded, which means that trends had room to continue, which is what they did, right? So I didn't lose any money while they were killing it. Now, the next game is going to be when these trends do end, will I catch them? You know what I mean? And hopefully I will. But it's been a good thing because, it, you know, and I always tell people, you know, you don't have to trade, use this data to trade like I do. If you're a trend follower, this data can help too. There's a difference between yeah. a trend that's not crowded and a trend that is massively crowded, right? You'd rather be in the trends that are not crowded and not be in the ones that are massively crowded. Mm. And that's exactly what this has has proved out to be in the last three months. Yeah, that's it. That's quite interesting. Yeah, so you could, in, in fact, you know, trade against your current approach by you know it's trading the trend and go, well, you're not in, so therefore the trend has a so chance. I could have, I could have, but yeah, you know, for me, you know, I, I manage a business right um, where I manage a handful of institutional um, clients allocation. And these institutional clients are, for the most part, fund of funds, right? And so as a fund of fund, they take money in, they give money to whatever, 10 different hedge funds, you know. Mm. <laughs> and what they're giving me money for, other than 
clearly my good looks is they are giving me money because I have negative correlation okay. to their other uh, return yeah. streams. Yeah. Um, so that's my job. You know what I mean? That's why I have a business, right? I'm part of a team. They have trend followers in there. Their job is to do the trend following. You know what I mean? My job is to do this counter trend stuff with negative correlation. Don't lose money when those guys are making, hopefully, and make money when those guys are losing. That's my job as a business, you know? And, and this is, again, also why I explain to a lot of people that are part of our service and on my webpage and all that, that, look, I'm showing the trades that I do mostly as a way to take you through my journey of my discipline. You know, what I'm trying to help people learn about is discipline and risk management. You know what I mean? So this is how I trade. Doesn't mean that's how you have to trade or should trade, but at least follow me so you can see my discipline, so you can see my risk management, right? Um, and I say like that, that's why this might not be for you. You don't care necessarily about your correlation to other people's returns. You care about your PL, right? So for you, okay, do some trend following maybe, and then do some counter, you know, do the counter yeah. trend thing, put it together or something. Right. But for me, I can't do that. I have a job to do in my business and, and that, that job is to do this counter trend stuff, you know? So, so like sitting through three months with, with no trading, you know, having, having you traded for 25 years and may pretty much placing trades every single month. <clears throat> how do you, how do you, you know, I suppose, how do you it's instill painful. that discipline? Yeah. I mean, it must be painful, but I mean, how, because I mean, what I like, I mean, talking from experience, I, I've sort of gone to the point where, like, you know, and three months would be like way too long for me. But even like, you know, over the period of time that I normally wait, I start to that the mind starts to go, oh, hang on a sec, what am I missing here? This kind of thing. How do you get over that? Like, have you had those sort of like hiccups where you're like, oh, maybe this is setting up, you know, and and doubts and all this sort of stuff. Have you had to manage that in that three month period, or are you sort of like at the point now? I, I definitely, def I definitely don't even need to. I, I put I put on two trades in the three months that I could argue were not really a hundred percent what my system told me to do. Right, and I had them all off within twenty four hours. Right, so it was like a limit order or something, and you you put it no, on. I there. put I put it on. Okay, I justified it. This is actually one of the great things about like my Discord channel, for example, which was kind of started on, on this whim. But you know, and I, I tell these guys the trades I'm doing, and they're all coming into me. Well, why are you putting that on? That doesn't 100% fit this. Thing. And I said, yeah. you know something? You're right. You know, I put the trade on. I go downstairs. I have a cigarette or something. I come back up, and and I'm like, you know something? I I, I shouldn't have that trade on. The next morning, I just get out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, like anybody, I am a person. Yeah. with behavioral biases that will, will screw me up uh, but it, it didn't cost me anything so you know yeah. fortunately it didn't cost me anything and would have if i had kept them on because all those that, trades were yeah. losers so and then i'd be kicking myself i always say i can accept as hard as it is trades that lose money according to my process i can accept it it sucks but i can accept it what I can't accept is losing money on trades that are not part of my process. That's mm -hmm. what I lose sleep over. That's what I kick myself over. That's what I sit up at night going, what the hell was I doing? What the hell was I thinking? I'm a loser. I'm a terrible trader. I have no discipline. All this shit that I try to teach people, I'm a hypocrite. You know what I mean? Um, so that makes it a lot easier for me to stick to the discipline. This has been the biggest test I've ever had right now. Three months mm -hmm. with no trades when I've had a complete total amount of two months in 24 years. This has been a huge test for me. Yeah. And I think I passed it pretty well. Two yeah. little slip ups, but they were all gone within 12 hours. Yeah. Uh, so, and, you know, it cost me really nothing. Right. So, uh, this has been a huge test. And, um, well, yeah, I what I tend to, what I tend to find is you end up like going, oh, look, it kind of matches the rules, or, uh, you know, or I might ignore that rule or this rule or, you know, oh, yeah. it's, your, it's, your you know, mind you will start, justify whatever you want to yeah, justify. You just now. start justifying it, and it's like that's the, you know, you, you the, the key is to try and remember last time you did that, so you don't do it again. Uh, and that can even be, you know, you have to probably. Well, and what also helps me too is that, like I say, these guys help me, but also the fact that not not that my clients know exactly my data and everything like that, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, my business is to do a certain thing, right? Now, I don't get paid if I don't make people money, okay? I'm on zero management fee and a higher incentive fee, but I, I don't get paid, you know what I mean? so I want to make money. But at the same time, 
they hired me to do a certain thing, mm. right? Um, so I have to do that thing, you know? And, and I went through when I raised money for this later latest iteration of my CTA. And that's how I chose, I don't want to sound too cocky about it, but that's how I chose the clients to manage money for, right? I didn't want people that were chasing my returns, right? I wanted people that understood what it was I did and how it fit into their portfolio, right? That was much more important to me. I always said to people, judge me based on the correlations of my returns to mm -hmm. the rest of your portfolio rather than my outstanding returns. If I lose the money, they're going to fire me anyway, okay? But judge me over time based on the correlation because that's what I'm trying to add to your portfolio, right? So I'd be a hypocrite to then do anything else, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I've asked them to do. The people that gave me money agreed with that, right? The people that gave me money understand that concept, and that's why they hire me. You know, I mean, I'm sitting here, quite frankly, you know, in a t shirt and pajama pants in my house with no employees, right? It's very hard for people to allocate money to somebody like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, but they do. Because there are very few people that can give them this sort of negative re return, negatively yeah. correlated return stream yeah. with positive returns. So they let me manage their money. So I have to do what, I, what I'm supposed to do for them. So, so that helps me also stay very disciplined, yeah. right? And as it turns out, in, in the heat of the moment, it's very difficult. But as time goes, and I've been doing this a long time, but look, even this latest thing was brand new to me. Three months without a trade, brand new, Okay. But now three months into it, I look at it and I say, Jesus, that was the best thing I ever freaking did because trend following is up 10, 15. I got trend followers up 20% this year and I'm flat. Well, I'm a hero if I'm flat when trend following is up yeah. 20%. Because if yeah. trend following were down 20%, I'd probably be up 20%, right? Yeah. So if I can be flat when, when my nemesis is up 20%, you know, the thing I'm supposed to be negatively correlated to is up 20%, it's actually heroic, right? Um, and on top of that, it should be a time when I'm theoretically supposed to be losing money, right? Which means when my next phase comes, which hopefully it will come, where I start to make money, I would just be making back losses. Whereas now, when these trends turn and I can start making money, I won't be making back losses because I haven't lost any money. So I'll be on my new highs immediately. Yeah. yeah. So while I won't get paid this quarter from anybody, unless I have you know a good march or whatever, in the longer term, it's going to pay me a ton yeah. to not have had anything on during this period. So these things help, you know, over time. It actually proves the process is working. When, when things are making money, of course, that's great. It proves the process is working. But another big thing is when it's not losing money, when it theoretically should be, that's equally valuable. And are you able to go, go back and have a look and go, look, you know, had I taken these sort of very average setups that don't meet your rules – but kind of like could have been close, you would have been down X number of percent and think, and think well, in fact, I'm actually, you know, currently I'm 6% up because I'm not 6% down or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to fall victim to, I mean, I do sit in front and watch these markets all day long whether our position's on or not. I, I'm more victim to the, oh, damn, you know, I missed that. I mean, there's one right now. I was super, super, super close, arguably, okay, to buying, you know, Palladium. Well, Palladium's up 11% today, okay? Um, and I'm not long it because of one little tiny thing on my data, okay? Um, so it's like, oh, shit, I could have just bought Palladium and, you know, the thing's up 11% today, mm. you know? And in fact, it's up more than 11% from the lows, right? Um, but the truth is that same little glitch is, or that same little off in the data that has kept me from being long Palladium has kept me from being long Palladium for a year and palladium has had rips during that year but always made new lows right so i missed those rips like oh shit yeah. oh shit but it always made a new low so it's like okay i would have made money for a period there but it never would have gotten me out and it yeah. would have just made lows and in the end i would have just lost money anyway so what's the point of that you know yeah now are there markets that turn without do i catch every single turn with my data no Markets turn sometimes without being super crowded one way or the other. They turn just for the hell of it, right? I miss trades. Um, but that's not the point. You're never going to catch every trade. You know, I just want to catch the ones I'm supposed to catch that my process is is telling me to catch, the yeah. low-hanging fruit, so to speak. 
you know, in 08, everything crashed, right? The stock market crashed. The bond market ripped, right? I didn't catch short stocks. Um, I didn't catch long bonds. My system was not set up for either one of those trades. But I did catch some other shit. And if you just look at my return stream, I had a really good 08. Now, trend followers had a great 08, fine. But I am not a trend follower. And I had a really good 08. But none of it had to do with catching the stock market crash or, or the bond market rip. I caught some whatever random move in natural gas and, you know, something else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But nobody goes back when they're looking at my track record and they're like, hey, where'd you make money in this? The point is, here's my return stream. And I, and I had a rip in 08. That, that's it. End of story. Right. And it's hard in the heat of the moment to remember that. But I remind myself of that all the time. I don't care where I make money ultimately, yeah. you know, okay. as long as I, I, I make it somewhere, it doesn't make a difference to me if it's an F's and P's. I mean, it's a big ego trade. Hey, I caught the stock market crash, uh, you know, yeah. but I don't care if it's an S and P's, if it's in bonds or if it's in corn or cotton, it doesn't make a difference to me. As long as the P and L goes positive, then I'm, I'm happy. You know, I'm interested to hear if, if you were able to do anything around the, uh, when, when oil went negative, did you, yeah. were you, were you in that at all? No. Okay. You weren't. Absolutely. What, what about your, uh, what about like, what about your typical sort of like trading week or day? How do you set up? I mean, for somebody who's like, you know, probably not as patient, not as disciplined, it's, it's it may be hard for them to even comprehend sitting out for three months, but I mean, it, we, we understand why. So, I mean, what about like, yeah, how does your day set up and how does your week set up? uh you know it's all here at this desk man my, my it's not just my day my, my whole life quite frankly is set up around this whole thing you know this is my desk is in is in the second floor of my house and i set it up this is where the kitchen is supposed to be well not the kitchen but i would say the dining room when we moved oh, in here this this was a dining room oh, i turned okay. it into my trading room <laughs> because my living room is right there my couch my tv i can watch my tv from here my wife does art her arts right there i can spend my whole day here and i can be with my wife and we can and i can sit right here right um and that's what i do with most of my day and night sadly enough but <laughs> right. but but truthfully that's kind of how it sets up i have weird very weird habits sleeping habits like the market will close at four i'll usually uh go and take a nap for a couple hours after that and then i'm up you know usually to like 12 or something. And then I have this weird internal clock thing where I wake up every night at four because for the first X number of years of my career, I traded nothing but Hang Seng Index. So my internal clock wakes me up right on the Hang Seng Index close. So I'll wake up at four. I'll come over here. I usually fall asleep on the couch over here in front of the TV. I'll come over here. I'll check out what's going on at night in the Asian markets for like 15 minutes and then I'll go to bed. And I'll sleep from four until my wife wakes up for work at like seven. And then I'll wake up at seven and whatever. And I'll sit here and, and I'll be here. And that's kind of my weird freaking day. Um, and then on the weekends, I spend time. Well, I write this, what used to be my personal trading plan and now has become my weekly newsletter that goes out to people. But I'll sit here on the weekend and I'll, and I'll write that, which will include a lot of research and a lot of listening and a lot of reading so that I can kind of develop, you know, I'm always trying to develop consensus, you know what I mean? So that mm. just takes a lot of reading and a lot of listening to people, you know, watching, you know, the weekend shows, Wall Street Week and all this crap and catching up on a bunch of videos of a bunch of bozos that are on YouTube just so I can figure out how to fade them. Um, or what they're thinking, you know, like this is the thing people, we always say don't trade fade right because the theory is that the vast majority of people lose money trading okay 95 percent of people mm -hmm. lose money trading so to me it strikes me as the easiest way to make money trading then is just figure out what they're doing and go the opposite way yeah. and just take the money they're losing you don't have to be smart like i'm not going to outsmart the market and you're not going to outsmart the market so quit trying to outsmart the market and just focus on making money you know, and, and and to me, the easiest way to make money is figure out what the people that are going to lose money do, which is relatively easy for me to do because I spent 10 years being one of those people. <laughs> right. All right. So, so I know what, and not only was I one of those people, I still, just like everybody else, we're all the same, man. I still think just like everybody else. So if I'm thinking it and then everybody else is thinking it 
and we're all thinking it and the position showing up that that's what they're all doing. Well, there's a good chance that fading it is going to make money, right? So that's really all I'm trying to do. So I spent a lot of time on the weekend trying to figure out what the consensus is, where people are positioning, what they're thinking and what's driving that. Now, now what about like if you had to sort of put your mind in somebody else who's, you know, coming into trader trading and listening to this for the first time, what would you give, what would you say like, okay, if I had to give you three steps to get, to get to profitable, what would they be? Yeah, it, it's hard because you're not going to believe what I'm saying. You know, you, you're just not going to believe it. I wouldn't have believed it when I started. What you're going to believe is I'm smart, which maybe you are, okay? And I'm going to figure this out, and I'm going to make money figuring out the markets, right? That's what you're going to think, and it's going to take time, and you're going to go through the stages that I went through, that everybody goes through, which, Jesus, this market doesn't make any sense, you know what I mean? And that's the point. The market doesn't make sense. So the first problem is you're trying to make sense of something that doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? You're, you're chasing a dream that doesn't exist, right? So it takes a while to get to that point, you know, because mm. of what we're taught by mass media, right? Like the market somehow, you know, these experts come on here and they say, oh, the Fed's going to do this and the blah, 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 right? And it's all a bunch of crap because the market is a discounting mechanism. So it's not going to make sense, right? Uh, it can't by definition. If it did, it'd be easy, okay? We know the Fed's going to do this, so we do this, okay? You know what I mean? But if everybody does that, then clearly it's not in there anymore, right? So because of the discounting part. So that's the first thing people have to get through. The smartest of people, of which I was not and never have been, and, and I don't know if I've met anybody, but can learn from other people and avoid these mistakes. I certainly wasn't able to do that. They All these things that I'm talking about are right in the Market Wizards books, okay? They're right in the first Market Wizards book. It was all in front of my face the first day I started trading. I read Market Wizards, right? But it took me 10 years for it to sink in. I had to go through 10 years of not making money before I, I, I realized it. And that's what most people will have to go through. Nobody listens to their dad, you know? I look back now. Somebody said to me, I forget the line, but it was like, when I was young, my dad was didn't know anything. But as I got older, he got a lot smarter, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's like that. Like, I never listened to my dad, right? Because that's not what we do. We want to be ourselves. We don't want to listen to our dad. We want to be our own man, so to speak, right? But if you go back and you had listened to your dad, you probably would have saved you a hell of a lot of pain, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but we don't because that's, for whatever reason, human nature. And, and there's probably a reason for it, right? That's how you develop your independence and all that stuff, right? Kids get rebellious at 16, 17. They should get rebellious at 16, 17 because they're trying to break away and become their own person. You know, it's a natural order of things. But so that's the first problem is, is you're not really going to listen to me or anyone else because you have to learn for yourself. But I think the important thing to understand is it, it can be done. You know, um, I've worked for large hedge funds. I know a ton of hedge fund traders and hedge fund people and all this. And I will tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt, the only difference between a guy that works for a hedge fund and manages a billion dollars and you or some retail trader, the only difference is the business card. That's right. it. <laughs> Pretty okay. Amazing. The guy went to some school, you know what I mean? And got some MBA or whatever. And had a friend who worked for some hedge fund and got a job, okay? But he's no better at the market and has no better information than you do. I, I, I can guarantee you that, right? I've, I've, I've witnessed it, okay? There's no difference. And I have, again, after working with many, many hedge fund people, and now I have this discord and, 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 and a lot of the people on, we have a few what I would call professional traders on the discord, but 85, 90% are, are typical retail traders. And I listen to them and I, I hear their thought process and what they're doing. And there's no difference, man. They're just as smart or whatever as any of these hedge fund guys. So what I'm saying is it, it can be done, okay? You can beat these people, right? Just understand it, it's a very small amount of people that are going to do that, right? Um, and so therefore, if you want to be part of a very small amount of people, then you have to think differently than the large amount of people by definition, right? And that's true in anything in life, right? Um, so I think that's an important lesson to understand. And again, you probably won't listen to me, but in time, as your time and your journey goes on, think of these things. And I think that you will find them to be true. Mm. You know, like on our, on, on my thing, I don't, there's a lot of like tip sheets out there and shit that are telling people how to trade, you know, 
Those are never going to freaking work, I promise you. Okay, that's all fucking that these people lie. There, there's no regulation to these tip sheets, right? They can make up whatever they want. 90% of our trades made money. No one's checking on that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, a, and we don't do that at all. I'm not here to be a tip sheet. Like I show my trades, like I say, as a way for people to go through my journey with me. Um, but we're, I'm trying to be a conduit to learning for people not a conduit to hey buy fucking soy meal because i'm buying it you know what i mean i'm trying to be a conduit towards this is what matters mm -hmm. discipline you know what i mean risk management not copy trading jason shapiro's trades because he was in market wizards right yeah that yeah. doesn't work right it doesn't work um and i know some people still do it okay but i think that's the important thing to realize right and that's what we try to do. I'm trying to help people learn the, these lessons, and it takes some people time. And but I think those are the important things to to understand, you know. And, and if you're not having success trading, it's not because you're stupid. You know what I mean? It's just ninety five, ninety eight percent of the people are going to lose money. So you have to at some point, and you're gonna, and also you're gonna make money at times. And when you do, you're gonna think you're freaking awesome. You know what I mean? Well, when I started, I was 23 years old. It was a massive bull market. I didn't come from a lot of money, you know. I had a job that was paying me decently. So I had some extra income that I could throw into the market. But I mean, you know, I made like half a million dollars in eight months, right? Damn. Which was a shitload, which was a shitload yeah. of money for a 23 year old kid. And yeah. as far as I was concerned, man, it wasn't long until I was George Soros. I was clearly <laughs> the great, you know, I was clearly the greatest trader that ever lived, right? And I was going to be George Soros in no time. And so I went out, you know, and I bought my Porsche and, you know what I mean? And hit the strip club, you know, and, and I did the thing that every sort of, not every, but a lot of 23 year old kids would do in that situation. And then of course I lost it all, you know what I mean? because that's what happens. Right. So like my whole life, even to this day is centered around this stuff. My whole financial life is centered around this stuff. The way that I live, the way that I spend my money, the way that I do everything is centered around trying to be successful at this, which means I don't buy a Ferrari. You know what I mean? It means I don't buy a, a mansion and, and, a, and a, you know, a summer house and, and, and all this stuff because I don't want the nut. You know what I mean? Because I don't want that to affect my psychology mm -hmm. of trading. When I was 30, you know, I thought like that. At 56... After the ups and downs and the ups and downs, it, it's all centered around the, the, this whole thing. People make fun of me that I'm so cheap, and oh, how come you don't move into like you know, uh, you know, the twenty thousand square foot house, and how come you're not driving a sports car and all this stuff? And I'm like, first of all, I'm past it. I'm old enough that I don't care about that shit. But second of all, it, it doesn't fit into. I had an interview with a guy a couple of weeks ago. I interviewed a client of mine who hires a lot of traders, and he said. You know, be successful at life means you could be successful at trading, right? And it's the same thought process in life. You know, spend less than you have. Spend less than you make. Be cheap, right? Because that's what's going to help you be successful in trading, you know? It's not this, hey, I bought a whole bunch of ODT options today and I made enough money to go out and buy me a Porsche. You know what I mean? Like, that's, it's not going to work, man. Over yeah. time, that kind of thought process is going to kill you. Yeah. Now, now, now what about, like, you know, talking about thought process, mindset, did you have to try and do any work on your mind to try and get yourself in the right headspace for Constantly, being disciplined every single, every single day? And what? And there any I, like I meditate or... every day. I meditate okay. every day. Yeah, which helps. It's something I picked up when I when I lived in Asia and I traveled across Asia and I got into like, I got into meditation. Um, and over the course of God, thirty years, I've kept that up. And and you know, you do that for thirty years every morning for fifteen minutes, even right. That shit will change your life, first of all. I can guarantee you that. But not everybody wants to do that, and that's fine. But that helps me a lot. First thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I, I meditate for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, and that helps with my mindset a lot, too. Um, and, and, you know, you have to somehow get these external pressures away from focusing on what it is you're trying to do. And it's become funny because... Here I have people paying for a service now, right? And as much as I tell them, this is not a tip sheet, this is an educational service to help you become a better trader, they still want to hear trades. 
and I haven't had a trade in three months, right? And so there's, sometimes I feel like pressured about that. Like, oh shit, these people are paying me whatever, a hundred dollars a month and I haven't given them just shit for a fucking trade in three months, right? <laughs> yeah. The hell am I doing? I'm ripping them off, right? So there's a little bit of external pressure there, but the truth is, you know, it is what it is. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm telling people what it is. I'm not saying don't come here as a tip sheet, you know? Mm. And so it's become part of the lesson that I'm helping them learn is, hey, there's no trade in your process. There's no trade in your process. You know, that, that's what it is. And it's proven to be good, as I talked about. But in the heat of the moment, sometimes it, there's a lot of external pressure. But you have to just focus on what it is you're supposed to do, you know. And, and what also has helped me a lot was I I was always involved in music. Um, and that when I moved, I was in a band that I played drums in for about 10 years. And I moved far enough away that I couldn't still be in that band. And I didn't really have room to play drums, so I, I picked up the guitar a few years ago. Um, and that helps me, too, you know? It, it's something outside. Like, mm -hmm. I'll sit over there on my couch, and I'll play guitar for a few hours a day, and it's something that I enjoy, something I'm not particularly good at, but something I can get better at and work out. And I don't even have to necessarily be good at it to enjoy, you know? I mean, I'm good enough that I can enjoy it, and I can improve upon it as I take time, but there's no destination with it, you know what I mean? I'm not... At this point, unfortunately, I'm not going to be, you know, Jimi Hendrix, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. or or someone like that, right? I'm just yeah. a guy that's kind of having fun playing guitar. And so that's a nice outlet because, you know, with trading, it's very competitive. I'm trying to be the best I can. I'm trying to make the most money I can, obviously, right? Um, with that stuff, there is no competitiveness. I'm not going out and playing in, you know, in a battle of the bands or I'm not trying to make it as a guitar player unless, of course, there is an agent out there. Yeah, do you want to do a quick uh, solo, and we'll see if we can get you hooked yeah. up somewhere. No, I mean, yeah, if there's an Asian out there that does want a 56-year-old, you know, a little fat guy who's not very good to become a rock star, let me know. Yeah. But outside of that, you know, I'm not really trying to get anywhere with it. So that becomes a lot of, takes the pressure off of yeah. a lot of that stuff, right? Because it's just something I do to enjoy. I think it's important to have something you do to enjoy. Yeah. Um, what I have also found in my later years... Um. You know, when I was 30, I was focused on one thing, right? Be a billionaire. You know, that was it. Money, yeah. money. Yeah. I wanted to make money. I wanted to make money. I wanted to make money. And I was never a religious person, you know, so it was all kind of about me and the money I could make and the life I could give my family and all that. But what I have found in the last few years is actually, and this sounds a little corny and most people aren't going to get this because you, you don't really get this until you're older, but. I, I have found the more in life that you give, the more you get back, right? So think about in whatever way you can, I think, give somehow to mm. something. It not to be a lot. You might not have a lot of money. You don't have to give money, but give time, give something. I, I have learned this, and I, I, I've come to believe this as strongly as I believe anything, right? The more you give in this life, the more you get, Right. Um, oh, yeah, I think there's the definitely what, what's it's... the Beatles line, you know, and in the end, the love you give is easy to the love you get is is equal to the love you give or something. It, 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 it's it's hard to, to understand. It, it's hard to believe, but it, it, it's a fact. And it, that also helps you de-stress and, mm. and focus on on your trading and, and, and your process and all that stuff, because you're doing something else that's helping people is just makes you so much more comfortable in yourself and what you're doing. Mm. And like I say, people, I usually lose people at this point in this conversation, but I, I can't stress it enough. Well, it goes back to the theme. I mean, contrary and, uh, you know, some people aren't you know going to be doing that, but I mean, can you give us like one example of something that you give uh, either time wise or money wise that, you know, somebody can walk away with and go, okay, well maybe I could do that as well. I mean, the number one thing that I'm giving at this point really is, is, is my whole internet thing because people are like, Oh, you, you, you charge your money. I mean, we charge like a hundred dollars a month for that. Um, and that money goes to the people behind the scenes who are running it to make sure that it runs correctly. You know, I don't, I don't take money from this. Show, okay. Um, so I'm giving that that's my mm -hmm. time, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying, yeah. you know, it's like, what can I give? Right. This is all I know. You know, so this is really all I can give, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I feel like, you know, if a thousand people join this thing, 
maybe 100 to 150 to 200 are really getting the lessons. And that becomes a little frustrating sometimes because some people get on there and they're not picking up anything that I'm saying, but it's impossible. You know, it, like you can lead a horse to water, you can't make him drink, right? But the 150, 200 people that are getting it mm. um, have sent me, you know, messages many messages you know hey man i fucking turned this all around listening to your shit you know, and that's extremely satisfying for me you know mm. you can focus on the 800 people that aren't getting it or you can focus on the 200 people that are getting it right yeah, yeah. I, I i tend to focus on both but I, i'm i'm hoping I, I i like to focus obviously on the 200 people that are getting it i feel like maybe i i actually am helping people and that's like I say, as a young person, you don't really give a shit about that. But as an old person, you start thinking about your legacy. You start thinking about what have you done on this freaking earth, you know? And I always say, like, okay, so maybe I figured out a way to pick off the weakest traders in the market so I can make money. And I don't make excuses for that. Okay, it's fine. I buy at the offer. I sell at the bid. I don't force anybody to sell me anything. And I don't force anybody to sell anything to me, right? So I, I don't feel guilty about that. That's how I make my living. That, But at the end of the day... What did you do with your time on earth? You know what I mean? Did you help yeah, anybody? Yeah, exactly. You know I mean? Exactly. Hey, look, we're Go gonna ahead. we're gonna we're gonna wrap up with one last yeah, question okay. here because okay. I know we're sort of knocking on the hour here. Um yeah. so this this will be an interesting one. What what's your preferred trading book or resource? Is it gonna be on the market wizards or something else? The market wizards books to me are the best books. The first one, the second one, and the hedge fund market wizards. I think there is so much information in there you know it's like trading believe it or not there is a rule book to this right cut losses let winners run you know don't chase them you know don't add to lose all these type of things there is a rule book um and those rules are all in there anything that i've talked about here i did not make up okay these are all things that all these guys talk about right so i think that those three books to me are the greatest books I have not read a trading book in probably 15 years because I feel like I read them all. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean, become like, you know, I, I then started focusing on psychology books and stuff like that because I'm so into the behavioral aspect of it all. Um, and you start to want to understand why people are making bad decisions at the wrong times. And I got into the psychology, but I did find a book a couple of years ago that's called um, How We Win or Lose, which was written like in the, it was written in the 30s. Oh, really? Um, and uh, I think it's a great, you could read that book in an hour, all right? It's like a hundred page book. And it was, it was written by a guy who wasn't even a trader, but he was a journalist type of guy. And he just got involved in the markets in the 28, 29 situation. And then wrote what he thought was an unbiased view about how it is. And his conclusion was essentially the only way to make money in the market is do the exact opposite of what everybody tells you to do. Right. And he didn't go into it with that thought process, right? He came out of that, uh, with that conclusion. So that I thought was a great book. Uh, how I think it's called How We Win or Lose. Right. Well, 1930s, I think we'll be able to find out. What I'll do is hook that up in the show notes. Um, let's wrap this baby up here. So before we wrap up, what is the best way for the traders to get hold of you? So we have this crowdedmarketreport.com that you can check out. Um, I do YouTube videos every weekend. Sometimes I actually did one today that's going to drop tomorrow because I have one for the weekend already. And I, I did one today because I thought it was a very important point. So I wanted to get it out before the weekend. But that's all, you know, free on YouTube, Crowded Market Report. I, I probably have 200 videos on there by now because I do one every week. And then I'm on Twitter, which is more silly than anything else. I usually put stuff on Twitter where I'm trying to get conversation going about a certain thing, you know, and people get mad at me and you know how Twitter is, right? Yeah. I'll put something like that, like yeah. all technical analysis sucks. And <laughs> people will get on there and rip into yeah. me. I make yeah. millions of dollars using technical analysis, blah, blah, blah. but I'm really just trying to get a conversation going, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I think that's where people learn from, right? Yeah. Especially when people are angry, right? It shows emotion, it shows yeah. bias, right? So I'm on Twitter. I think it's like crowded underscore MKT underscore RPT, I believe is what it is. But we're on there, free, YouTube is free, and then the crowdedmarketreport.com if you really want to get into it, you know, it costs like whatever, $100 Brilliant. a month or something or $125 a month, but yeah. What we'll do, folks, is we'll hook those all up in the show notes. So um, to find them, they'll actually be below this video or in the podcast description. Now, look, Jason, thank you very much, mate. It's been absolutely 
awesome having you on some great insights here i know there's going to be a ton of value that's been taken away from this um, if you folks are on trading that then search for jason in the search box and you'll find him there but until next time i wish all my listeners trading happiness and success <laughs>